right. Well, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity to speak today. It's a, a real honor and a privilege. And I'll try to make this as uh, fun and, and easy and, and short as, as possible. Uh, one of the things that uh, we just kind of want to talk about today in, in setting you know, the, uh, the goals of today, what's the purpose? You know, today I just want to teach you an approach that I've used for the majority of the past 36 years that will help uh, empower you to the view charting in a whole new and different way and improve your decision-making process. So I, I hope that that's what I want to try to, to do today. Uh, it's, it's teach. Um, I will have somebody from our company, Rick Bertino, that will come on after I'm done. We do have some specials to, to offer today that Rick will pass along, but I'm just going to try to do the education part and, and have some fun, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, we want to try to help teach you how you can make technical analysis concise, uh, very timely, and actionable. That's our goals, and we want to just share with you how you can do this on your own. But one of the things we want to talk about uh, as far as a, a shop a Kimball Charting solution shop perspective is we're not a bull or a bear. Uh, we believe that being bullish or bearish is nothing more than a psychological state of mind. Um, so please always keep it in mind that we don't have any uh, grand roadmaps of uh, where this giant financial experiment's going to go. We just want to have fun and try to find uh, what we call emotive points, key emotional turning points that can provide quality entry and exit points that have high risk reward potentials. So one of the things I was fortunate about is to be a student of Sir John Templeton and he shared some things with me in the, the late 90s that we'll go over later but one of the things that he talked about were the four stages of a bull market and that he believed that bull markets are born on pessimism, they grow on skepticism, they mature on optimism and they die on euphoria so today's focus is going to be what we do as far as how we're trying to find these two outer extremes, this scared-looking face of pessimism and this kind of cocky or excited guy rep that represents euphoria. And we want you to think about your, if you're married, your spouse, uh, your neighbors, your coworkers, uh, sports team places uh, that you just, uh, your charitable uh, organizations, when you start seeing these extremes and emotions and friends and loved ones and relatives and co-workers how they can become an advantage to you so when Sir John he it, it scared me at the time everyone but in the late 90s he said Chris I want to give you reasons to why I think the market at best could be flat for 10 to 15 years I didn't care for what he had to say but it, it, it really he was accurate and it was important so we want to look I just kind of want to build what we want to call an emotional educational chart so this chart uh, looks at an asset over the, the last uh, 12 years and we're going to start off this, it's, it's about the pattern everyone, it's not about the asset itself. We'll, we'll name what this asset is, but this is about pattern recognition. Our strategy is called TBNM, which stands for tops, bottoms, and no middles. So how do we find the potential of these extreme turning points? So the first thing that we want to look for is uh, negativity or pessimism. So we want to find what does a pattern look like for pessimism. So what we did is, or what we do is in, a, in the, what you want to call an experimental process, is trying to build puzzles, emotional puzzles, based upon emotive points or emotional turning points. It doesn't matter why this asset happened to hit a low and create a series of higher lows or what the asset is or, or the reasons to why, but it just happened to. So here's how we build charts and try to find solutions and opportunities. And this is what we, this is the, what I've done the majority of the last 36 years, and I just want to empower you to how to do the same. So we want to look for pessimism, and so we created a potential support line down here. But what we do is we try to find tops by actually looking for bottoms. So we've now found a, a potential bottoming point. You can kind of see overall whatever this asset is, no matter what it is, it's an overall rising trend. So we take this uh, bottom line and then I just want to duplicate it. Let's just see if we can find any rhythm of, of these emotions. So here's a duplicated line that we're going to tie to this high here in 2008. And you'll notice that there was a series of times that whatever this asset was, it peaked out along this parallel line to this pessimism down here. At the same time, then we're going to want to draw other lines, here's a point of pessimism, continuing support, and then it became resistance a couple of times, and lo and behold, 
they both happen to meet at the same price point. We like to look at relative momentum. We've applied that so you can see at the time that whatever this asset was was hitting potential dual resistance, relative mo momentum was overvalued. And you'll notice each time it was overvalued, or the last few times, excuse me, was at the top of this channel. Another time was at the top of this channel. Here we are again. So then we also want to take and we applied Fibonacci to this high to the low that both touched these channels and applied a 161 Fibonacci extension to it. And lo and behold, it happened to hit at the same price point as momentum is overdone. So this asset at the time that it was at the top of this channel also had 92% bulls uh, this past summer. So this was a nice setup. Then we'll see the resulting uh, result of what happened to this pattern afterwards. You'll notice that it fell uh, very hard uh, following that time frame and roughly from, where were we everybody, from around 145 in price down to 120. So we'll disclose what this is, and this is TLT, the government uh, long government bond, and we shorted it up here at this price point, what we felt was an extreme, and TLT just happened to experience one of the largest 20-week declines in history. So this is uh, how we try to build opportunities and solutions into these as we look for extremes. So I want to share a couple of other things that was going on at that same time that you can go do on your own. Now you can go to uh, stockcharts.com and one of the things that we apply or create are filters. And so this was a filter on TLT and we wanted to look for one-year returns and this is uh, looking back since TLT was actually created in, between, uh, two, in the year 2002, excuse me. So you'll notice that uh, there were some extremes in one-year returns. And so any time that TLT was, had made 30% or more in 12 months, we highlighted where that took place. And so you can see that TLT was very close to a peak each time these 52-week returns were up here this high. So I would encourage you to, within the, the parameter, and you can do this for free at Stock Charts, is to start creating these type of uh, performance analysis to uh, tip you off to opportunities. And so you'll notice uh, this past summer, as TLT was hitting resistance, the bond TLT, or the ETF, excuse me, was up almost 30% in a 12-month time period. And it only happened a few other times. So this is what we're looking at is for, are for extremes and emotions and also extremes and in performance. So this is one of the, the filters that we use uh, to find opportunities. Here's another filter on the same trade was uh, at the time that TLT was hitting this potential resistance, momentum was overdone. This is from cinematrader.com that this summer there was 80% plus bulls uh, at the peak in prices in July. So all of these pieces were making us feel better about going against the trade, looking for a nice uh, risk-reward opportunity. Because if TLT would have broken out, we had our stop right above that. Uh, it's nice to be blessed and it's nice to be lucky. And we were both lucky and blessed that at the time we happened to short TLT was the week of the high. And then we experienced, or it experienced, one of its largest declines, which if you turn that around or shorting, is was one of the greatest opportunities to make money in this trade uh, in the last 20 years. So another thing that you can go do in creating filters on your own, this is also from stock charts, is we're all familiar with moving averages and uh, oftentimes people use the moving averages as buy and sell signals and there's not a thing wrong with that. We use them a little bit differently just as a filter to try to find uh, extremes. And so this is an example that you can set up a formula, which we did, and we looked for the percent any asset is above or below its 150-day moving line. Now you could make this 130 days, you could make it 200, whatever you choose. There's not a, a more right or wrong, but this is one that we've been using for quite a while. So this is the percent above or below the 150-day moving average line. So you'll notice uh, Here's a couple of things of constructing uh, a power of the pattern and extremes. So there was a potential right here that the yield on the 10-year the ten year yield could be at a double bottom. And you'll notice this large decline. It, it was down almost see, about 25% in uh, 52, or it was, excuse me, it was 25% below 
It's a 150-day moving average. And you can see not many times over the last 20 years has it been that far below its moving average. So that really got our attention. So you'll notice, again, you know, we're looking for pessimism that you've seen a large decline, potential double bottom, and we went and went long yields and shorted bonds here. So now we're going to see kind of what the results were after that. You'll notice this huge rally up in yields uh, that took, or now I said, would say not took, but the, um, the 10-year yield is now 32% above its 150-day moving average line, which, as you can see right here, has only happened one other time in the past 30 years. So we have an extreme on the other side, and this extreme is taking place up against a falling resistance line. And the summer when 90, over 90% 90 of investors were bullish bonds, now the table is flipped that, you know, there's obviously a lot of different sentiment studies, but from sentiment trader, uh, the bond sentiment right now is, is roughly about 10 percent, you know, bond bulls. So we're, we went from one extreme in July to the other in, in quick order. So again, this is a, a rare filter that you can set up. You can go to stock charts, something I'd suggest for you to do. This was a piece from Ned Davis in the bond market, and I'm just kind of wanting to kind of share with you. There's a lot of noise here, but this is bond futures on the top. This is their indicator of ex excess optimism or pessimism over the last decade, but here's kind of what intrigues me along the line that we've already shared with you that, you know, how you can create these filters on your own, but here was a statistical analysis from Ed, or Ned, excuse me, that was very close to what we're doing here. But what it shows, you know, right now is that uh, there's excess pessimism taking place. They used a barometer of uh, what the 38, per 38 line in the sand, and you can see right now it's below that. And so, what Ned Davis research did was they looked at any time bonds were below the 38 level, what was the future uh, gain, and from 1984 to current, whenever bonds were below 38 percent, the average gain uh, going forward was 9 percent. Now, since over the last decade, the numbers are a little bit higher, but not a bad move that the average gain was between 9 and 13 percent on bonds when you see this type of an extreme. So uh, as people are now uh, confident that the world is growing, interest rates are, are going to rise, they think, in different things. It was interesting that this summer only 5% uh, of people felt like the Federal Reserve was going to raise interest rates, and now after the, the markets have moved, now 95% of people think rates are going to rise. So I love the extremes that are taking place in this market, and that's why I wanted to share with you today, kind of teach you how that you can go do this on your own and you can find these opportunities. So um, we're going to build some more charts and following, but in the interest of time, I wanted to share with you uh, another ratio to kind of um, put some of the, the interest rate move together. This is uh, TIPS, the TIP, the Inflation Protected Bond, uh, divided by TLT uh, over the last six years. And you'll notice uh, this summer when we shorted uh, bonds or long yields, you'll notice how this ratio was uh, at its lowest point in the last six years, and then you can see this huge move up. But this huge move up now has the ratio hitting dual potential, dual resistance, and you can see as I have made this uh, over the weekend, everybody, that of this past week, you can see the ratio has created a potential reversal pattern or bearish wick up against dual resistance at price point two. So we've seen quite a change uh, from July to essentially the first of uh, November, uh, very radical moves which are just create opportunities. Like I said, we were fortunate and blessed to, to be on this, but we want to share kind of now where are we and what type of moves could you go make on your own and what advantages, you know, are there using this type of an analysis. One of the things that, uh, you know, people ask, which I don't know the question of, is, is the 30-year the bull market and bonds over with? That's, you know, humbly folks, that's way above my pay grade. But one of the things that we try to keep a close look on is one of the quality government bonds of the whole world is the 10-year German Bund. And if you can, if somebody would hold a gun to my head and say, Chris, what's the cleanest chart on the planet? You know, I'd have to say it's probably this chart that you're looking at. So this is what a 36-year uh, rising channel that the Bund has, has been in. And you'll notice 
that each time it's hit support along the way, it's been a good time to be a buyer. So the decline in, in bonds of late, I know this is a 35-year chart, it's kind of hard to see it all, but there's been some softness in the boon, but at this black arrow, the boon is, st is still above support and testing it. So for all of this length of time, it's paid to buy on support until proven differently. And so it's, again, very close to 35-year support as sentiment extremes have shifted dramatically. One of the things that I want to also talk about and share with you today is how can you put these emotions together and, and I want to encourage you and educate you on how you spot emotional clusters. So this is a chart of a, an asset and you'll, you'll notice everyone in the lower right hand corner this, this M, we use Metastock software. This is a monthly chart going back 30 years and so I wanted to, we shared this with our, our members uh, this summer and we also I've posted it on a few uh, free blog posts uh, in different sites but I want to kind of just show you how we build and look for emotional clusters. And again, this is a monthly chart. So when you see lows uh, at these price points, they're, they're pretty extreme. But anyway, this is, uh, we want to encourage you to search for emotional clusters, and, and this is how we try to find them. So we see a rising support on a monthly basis coming into play. So we're trying to find and to connect as many emotional turning points as we can. It's not about why this asset came down and, and bounced hard, it's just that it did, that that's what the world, you know, this is all about billions of free thinking people and where they stand on an emotional standpoint, because this chart is nothing more than just indicators of e emotions. So you'll see a, another a support resistance line coming in, You're, you'll see another one coming in, you can see there was resistance here, broke above it, this was resistance, this was support, support, and then once it broke, it waterfalled. Here's the high in 2006 and 7 in this asset. And then here's another series. So we shared this you know, with the world for free and with our customers that this summer uh, in uh, July, August, that we felt like here was an, an emotional cluster of resistance that was coming into play. Now remember earlier we talked about how do you find tops. So you, you first go to the flip side of that that we have found very successful that works. And so we, we took these monthly lows because we can see that this asset is in a, a declining trend of lower highs and lower lows. So we pegged those and then I just created a parallel line, put it up against uh, this lower high and you'll notice they all came into play here. So this was what we felt was a, a really uh, opportunistic emotional cluster. If you were along this asset, this is where you'd want to harvest, uh, walk away or put your stops on tight or this is a place, if you're aggressive, to go short in this downtrend. So this emotional cluster uh, took place. You can see this asset, once it hit it, it, it has fallen. The cluster took place uh, at the 2145 level. And currently, just to, to let you know, this asset is silver over the last 35 years. And since this cluster came into play, silver declined from 2145 to 1675, fell around 20% in value. So again, this was a, an opportunity in, in two different ways to uh, either harvest if you were long or look to be getting uh, short, and it would have paid off handsomely in either way. So I encourage you know, all of you to try to find these emotional clusters. Uh, we find them very, very, very helpful. Um, and I'm showing a customer uh, yesterday this. They asked a good question. They said, Chris, what does it take to create an emotional cluster? And, I would say three lines would be uh, better than two, and four is better than three, so the more the merrier. And so as you can see, we had uh, what one, two, three, four, five, six different lines coming into place here, which was heavy resistance, but on the flip side, everyone, if silver would have broken out of that, that had been a really positive uh, message on a price perspective to go long because it would have really pushed above what I would have felt like at that time was an 800 pound gorilla resistance level. Obviously it didn't at the time, but again, the main point is not that this is about silver, this is about I want to encourage you to search for these emotional clusters because that's something that we're doing all the time and it's been very beneficial uh, for us you know, over the years to find these. Um, at the same time when this emotional cluster was coming into play, this is from Cinema Trader. This is the position of traders in the silver market. And as they would want to say, 
At this time, dumb money uh, this summer was making the largest bet on silver going up in silver's history. So, so far, that crowded trade has not paid out for the way people uh, were placing their bets. It actually paid to go against the crowd and to go against sentiment, you know, using the power of the pattern. So here's some opportunities that uh, uh, I, I feel uh, could be in play and uh, some solidification of long-term trends, whether they're going to stay or, or not. Again, you know, a lot of people keep asking the question, are, is the 30-year trend in, in interest rates changed? And, and again, I don't know, and I think it's just way too early to tell. But I do want to share that the, the pain in the interest rate market has caused pain in a few other interest-sensitive assets which I, I believe are opportunistic at this time. So let's again go back to the early stages. If we want to find if this is a bottom, we want to first try to look at emotional highs. So we go and create a, a, a series of uh, uh, channel lines based upon highs, and then we're going to go duplicate that line and create a parallel and place it upon the lows. So you can see this asset has fallen. It's very close to what is this, everyone? 2010, almost a six-year rising channel. And you'll notice at the same time that momentum is now oversold, similar to this level, which was at that channel or near the channel support. It was oversold here, was near channel support. Didn't get too oversold you know, here, but back in 2009, it, it sure did as well. So the, another uh, couple of things is, again, we want to try to find clusters of emotions or uh, channel support, and you'll see that there's potentially three uh, support lines here within this five-year, six-year rising channel. And at the same time, momentum is oversold or closer to the bottom. This is a weekly chart. And then down here at the bottom, we're not a, a volume shop by any means, but the one thing that I like to look at when assets, or I would encourage you, because you can do this on your own, is to go look for possible panics that a lot of times you'll notice, say, like this low that took place in 2011 pretty much corresponded with a high in, in volume. And you'll notice right in here we saw a spike in 2016. And then this spike was also took place at, at this low. So again, we're not a volume shop that we're trading upon it, but when we're looking for this type of a, a pessimism, oftentimes it can take place in selling panics. So you know this asset uh, is utilities. Uh, utilities have declined, as we all know. Uh, they're they're kind of in the interest sensitive interest rate field. So uh, the the pain in bonds has been felt in utilities. So uh, from a uh, a solution to what to do, here's one buying point. And if you're not in utilities, if utilities would break above this resistance line, that would be another great place to. Uh, become long utilities and then just place the stop right below this this channel. So uh, a nice little situation in the hard hit uh, utilities because you can see they went from 55 a share down to 45. I think that's around a 20% haircut in a few few months. Almost uh, the same percentage of uh, what TLT fell off. Here's another one. We're going to do the same thing. Let's look for bottoms by first looking for tops. So we'll apply the channel research. We're going to look for some more emotional clusters. And you can see that taking place that uh, have three potential support points with momentum overvalued, or excuse me, oversold. Uh, most of the time, uh, this is IYR, the real estate ETF. You can see that it was close to 90 a share, and, and now it's trading at 75. So again, almost a similar 20% haircut as Yields have went up, bond prices, real estate and utilities have, have come down to some very important price points. If somebody wants to debate the long-term trend in some of these, if utilities and uh, REITs would break this support, that would be the, a first that we haven't seen everyone in the last five or six years. That has not happened, but that would be a you know, kind of clue of instead of being uh, in the bond market, buy on support, sell at resistance, if these would break, then we would want to start thinking about the other way around on the trade as far as selling bonds at resistance uh, short and then taking profits on support. So again, this, these channels have not been taken out as of yet. Good, good uh, entry point with a tight stop. 
I want to share, this is a, a long-term chart, 16 years. Uh, you're going to notice uh, a couple of things. The black lines, we, in, in the interest of time, I, I took this look as we were looking for a top. I created this bottom chart as far as this bottom line. I have a series of lower highs. Created this, and I'd encourage you then to create a parallel line. Just duplicate that. And then, lo and behold, here was an emotional high and another high, and we tied them in. And you'll see resistance, channel resistance is still in play. I thought this was interesting that if you took the high in 2002 and the low, right now uh, the asset is at the 61% the retracement level. We also took uh, the low in 2008 and the high and applied Fibonacci at the 161 level. So you have channel resistance and two Fibonacci retracement levels all coming into play uh, right here. Uh, no secrets, the chart, if you didn't see it in the upper left before, this is the same chart again, everyone, and this is the U.S. dollar on a weekly basis. So the thing that I want to kind of point out is, you know, you can see uh, that it's up against this channel resistance with the Fibonacci coming into play. The upper left piece here is just a zoom in of just this last little bit, and again, this is a weekly chart. Uh, and I did this at the close of this past Friday. And you'll notice there's a chance that this could be a doji star topping pattern. Uh, nothing is proven, everyone, but it's interesting that this pattern takes place right at the top of this channel and two Fibonacci um, extension or retracement extension levels meet at one price point. So this has me very intrigued from here. Now I want to just show the opposite of this, everyone. And this is UDN, which is the inverse U.S. dollar trade, uh, non-leverage, a uh, 1x play. So you'll notice uh, that on the prior chart, we saw the U.S. dollar was in a long-term uptrend. Well, the opposite, of course, then would come into play on UDN. So UDN right now is testing, what are we looking at, 10-year support. We have a bullish falling wedge uh, coming down here. So we have a triple uh, potential support play. And just for full disclosure, uh, we are long this asset, UDN, or in other words, short the U.S. dollar at this price point with a tight stop. So a very intriguing play, and obviously how this trade pans out, uh, a lot of portfolio construction could be greatly impacted. If UDN breaks down, means the U.S. dollar breaks out. And obviously, on the flip side, if UDN would rally, it could give a little boost to some hard-hit uh, commodities. But still, the trend in the dollar is higher. The trend in UDN is lower. We're a, a, a reversal shop, so we're looking for a potential reversal uh, right here, and we've applied a tight stop to it. Sentiment-wise, just kind of sharing with you that the dollar right now is close to 80% bulls, and it's uh, that's close to highs that we've seen over the last 10 to 13 years. And again, this uh, comes from Cinema Trader. If you're not a subscriber of theirs, I would encourage you to. It's got a great shop and a great amount of, of information there for everyone. Sticking on the theme of extremes, going back, this is something that you can do. Again, another filter that we set up. This is from Stock Charts. And this is a 20-week performance, and this is looking at GDX. And, I just wanted to get this chart put together in the interest of time you know, for everyone. But uh, what you, you'll notice that GDX has just experienced a 32% decline in the last 20 weeks. That's the same uh, time frame that interest rates have went down. Seldom has GDX suffered this large of a loss in the history of uh, the ETF. And then I put in these green lines of other times that GDX had fallen this hard in 28, 20 weeks. Where was it on a, a chart basis? So you'll notice that even though GDX was in a downtrend, once it had fallen close to that hard, almost 20% in 20 weeks, there, there was a bounce here, there was another bounce here, another bounce here, a very large bounce here. So GDX is a very intriguing price point. This would be a, a good entry risk reward place to be uh, along the miners at this potential cluster of triple support with a, a rare um, performance that's probably scared the pants off of, a, of a, a lot of people if they've been long this position. Just kind of want to share with you even how all of this can work out even in a fund flows. This is a, 
a fund flows chart on a GLD on gold. Remember the cluster in silver, which we were talking about, that came into play this summer. Look where the extremes were. All of these uh, flows were, were very high. That's when that cluster of resistance was coming in. So as the crowd was, it was getting very crowded on the, the long side, it was probably not the thing to do. And I know this isn't a very long chart on flows, but it, it did catch my attention that you know, over the last few years, this is um, um, you know, one of the largest amount of flows away from gold as we see uh, GDX testing that triple support point and the dollar up against potential resistance. So I, I want to thank all of you at, at this time for sharing part of your day, uh, hearing uh, some things from a, a guy that's seen a, a few things in the past 36 years, uh, but I, I, I still want to say humbly, everyone, this has never been a more exciting time for me. Uh, I hope that today I, I shared with you just some of the things that we do uh, behind the scenes. Uh, this is uh, We just want to try to educate you and share ideas. But at this point in time, I'm going to turn the program over to, to Rick Bertino, and Rick will just tell you a little bit more about Kimball Charting Solutions and what we're trying to do to, to help people in, in this very fun and exciting marketplace that we're in. And again, thanks for your time, and, and Rick, thanks for helping out. Hi, everyone. Hopefully uh, you can hear me okay. Renee's going to actually switch uh, screens here, so give me a, a quick second, and we'll... We'll get rolling. Um, there we go. So, uh, forgive me up front. I'm a bit scratchy. I've, uh, I've been battling the end of a cold here, so I might mute you here and there, uh, so I don't have to cough in your ear. But so you've just learned Chris's unique approach to finding opportunity. Are you there, we can't hear you. Um, I'm here. I'm on. Hmm. Can you hear me? Can everyone just type in the chat box if you can hear Rick as well? <coughs> yeah, can they hear can they hear me now? Everybody good? Good day. If we can't get this fixed, do you want to just flip it back to me? Can you uh it looks like somebody can hear me. How yeah, about it others? looks like a few people have said they can hear you. Okay, good. We're on. We're okay. All right. So, um, just getting back, you know, you've learned uh, Chris's unique approach to finding opportunities by identifying these unique emotional turning points in charts. So, the purpose of today was to empower you a little bit so you can learn to apply the same approach on your own. But we also understand uh, this type of research, if, if you like what Chris is doing and you'd like to know more about it, uh, or you want more of it, but maybe you don't have the time, you don't have the desire to do it yourself. As you would expect, we produce this same research uh, every day and every week for, for members. Think of it as, uh, we'd like to think of it as, as your 30-second solution to investment research. So what do we mean by that? If Chris is producing all these, all these charts which, which have all the emotional turning points, all the lines drawn on them, what's left for you? hopefully about 30 seconds to figure out what the pattern is and the action to take. That's the goal. So uh, that's what we produce weekly and we also produce it daily for members. So <clears throat> let's take a look here at what you, could, what you could get from Chris's research in terms of the type of things that he produces for our customers every day and on a weekly basis. What are you going to get? Opportunities to grow your portfolio, either going long or going short. Actionable trade ideas, portfolio ideas, that's something, again, Chris is going to produce on a weekly and a daily basis. Now, when I say daily, I'm not talking about day trading. We're not day traders. We don't even look at ourselves as a trading shop. We look at ourselves as a chart research firm, and uh, as a publishing firm, we publish chart research to help people make better decisions on their own. The greatest thing that charts do for people, if you're not already using charts on your own now, is to filter out the noise, the bias, and opinions. You may do a lot of fundamental research, which is great. Nothing against uh, the fundamental research. But what a chart does for everyone, of course, is filter out the noise. In one picture, you can see what millions of people are thinking about an asset at any given time. That's all we do every day to produce for you. It's, it's ideas through charts, actionable ideas. Hopefully, at the end of the day, it improves confidence and your decision-making, and that is certainly our end goal. 
couple of things that our subscribers have said I thought you might find of interest just to hearing, you know, this uh, Michael was a longtime subscriber and he just said, you know, your research is really easy to understand. It's simple. It's clear uh, in terms of um, the, the updates that we provide and, uh, and offering ways to, to uh, share this research in a very simple, uh, direct approach and he made profitable trades. Um, when you get a, a comment, for example, from Todd, Todd's a financial advisor. Uh, happens to be a premium member. You know, a couple things Todd has shared. It's, he does his own charting, but Chris's charts actually helped him redesign his own charts to make better decisions, draw better lines. Now he feels more confident making his own decisions and in his charting. Um, also, he likes the fact that we provide him uh, actionable ideas, and we, we serve as a sounding board for his own research. Tom kind of said the same thing and gave us a great compliment by saying he uses other research, but Chris is kind of his anchor research. He uses re Chris's research to verify everybody else's, which is great. I mean, we, we're believers in, in research, not just from one provider, but if you can afford it, two or three, so that you can really compare and make, hopefully, hopefully things align, then you make the best decision. So two types of research, guys, that we pr produce here, weekly and, and what we call our premium. On the weekly side, we cover nine key global assets. We also cover sectors and commodities and we cover the metals. That's actually three different reports. This is one report, the sector commodities is the second, and the metals is the third. In our premium research, it's daily. In other words, Chris is producing research and, uh, and looking at pattern opportunities on a daily basis. As you would expect, our premium covers everything, so it's covering the most assets, it's covering the most opportunities that we share, plus it includes all the weekly reports. So two basic choices of weekly research versus premium. Now on our weekly, we charge $67 a month for our weekly research, but we also have something we call weekly combo, and that's combining three reports. We knock off 50% when you combine the three, so you're essentially you're getting one free. When we do a webinar like this with uh, Investor Inspiration, we'd like to, to add uh, a little additional discount, if we can, for, for members uh, for attending this, this webinar. So instead of the $137, it's $99 a month. So you get the three weekly reports, that's 99 going forward, and that, that's not going to change. It's not a one month, it's 99 permanently. So uh, that's the, the weekly research, if that's something you have interest in. If you want the premium, the premium is 397 normally. This is what we'd like to do today, is give you the first month free. I know these promotions and giving you a month free is nothing new, but I'd like to have you look at it maybe a little bit differently than you have in the past. If you're open to the research that we produce, go for all of it. That's premium. It gives you a chance to see the weekly reports and test and, and, and uh, review everything that Chris produces on a daily basis. And at the end of that 30 days, either you decide to keep premium and go forward, or you might decide, you know, I don't need as much, I don't need the premium, I don't need everything Chris produces, but here's maybe I, I want one of the weekly or I want all three of the weekly. And if you do, if you want the, the three weeklies, will accommodate you with the offer that we've made today. So you have the choice of going with premium, checking things out for 30, and then switching over to weekly if, if you'd like or staying with the premium. So here's are the, these are the two offers for today for this webinar. Um, the, the offer ends this week. It's not a lot of time, but obviously if you see something that you know makes some sense, then you're going to make a decision pretty quickly. So hopefully uh, enough, a few days is enough for you to make that decision. All you would do on our website here is, is uh, you go to our checkout page and, and essentially uh, our cart page and either use this promo, promo code, if you'd write that down, see promo 99, that's for the weekly, P start free is for the premium discount. If I can do this real quick, uh, folks, we're going to, I'll just show you. There's a link that I put in the chat box and I'll do it again. This link is for the combo. So we're going to go here and if you literally put that link into your browser, hit enter, it'll take you to the checkout page. You will put C promo in here, 99, and you apply that coupon and you'll see down here how it takes 137 down to 99. Do the same thing with premium. Take that link anywhere on you don't have to be on our site to do this, but the link itself will take you right to that checkout page. 
And then here we do P start free, apply the coupon, same thing. First month free. So if you if you don't do either of these, just you know you could start from our home page, and you could go right to the checkout, and uh, it'll take you to the same place. You just apply that to it, apply the coupon, and you'll get to the same place with the same result. Um, I think that covers how to use the coupons, and uh, that covers the rest of the the end of the webinar, guys. We really appreciate you taking the time to come and attend Chris's uh, presentation. If you have any questions. You can get a hold of us back here at uh, either dialing our toll-free number. You can always email us. We'll certainly follow up with each of you as well. And again, thanks so much for attending, and we uh, look forward to connecting with all of you soon.